So thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Alan. I'm going to talk about this cache, provable load balancing for large-scale storage system with distributed caching. So this is a joint work with folks from Johns Hopkins University, College of William Mary, Belfort Networks, and UC Berkeley. So in this work, we introduce a new practical mechanism to do load balancing on a data center scale and also showcase that the latest high-performance networking devices like programmable switch can probably help storage systems. So let me start. Today, large-scale data center uh, cloud services, they need large storage clusters. Big players like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, and so on, their cloud services are serving billions of users around the world. So what behind these cloud services are some large data center clusters and stock clusters for their storage needs. So here is a high-level overview how the data center cluster looks like. However, storage servers has load imbalance issue. We learned from the paper from Facebook in 2012 at the Sigmetrics saying that the typical workloads to their storage clusters has two properties. First of all, they are highly skewed and follow some power law distribution, and they are quite dynamic. So here, highly skewed means there are only a few of items that are very popular. They occupy lots of bandwidth and in the workload. And dynamic means the hot items are keep changing. So the skewness of these workloads bring imbalance to the backend storage servers. Assuming your storage services are using some random hardship based partition, like memcached and so on. To solve the load imbalance issue, there are several solutions. First of all, can we consider consistent hashing? It has been proven that consistent hashing works really well for handling dynamic and skew workloads. But they cannot, oh, sorry, they cannot, um, hand, they handle static, but they cannot handle dynamic and skewed workloads. And we can consider traditional data migration or replication to do the load balancing. If you move your data around to many servers and replicate your items into many servers, and then you have multiple choices for the same item, then the loads can be more balanced. However, this kind of moving around and replication incur large system and the storage overhead. And to make the data consistent, it also has high coherence cost. Third, let's consider using a front-end cache as a load balancer. This is a pretty uh, more new latest result. So the good part of the front-end cache is that we can keep very low update overhead. There's only one copy in the hash. And it can work for arbitrary workloads. So in today's talk, we consider using, hashing, uh, using caching as a load balancer. Period result back to 2011 has proven theoretically and empirically that to balance the end servers in a cluster, you can simply just cache the hottest a big O of unlocking items for the end servers. Here, you, you don't need to remember this unlock M, but just keep in mind, you just need to cache the items that only depends on the number of servers you want to balance. And then there is a requirement that your front end cache needs to work as fast as the aggregate of end servers. Then you're good. All server loads can be balanced. So based on this result, there are some applications recently. In the NSDI 16 and SOSP 17, they are using some newer devices like SSDs and the software switches and hardware switches to, to act as this cache node. So it has been showing that using a single cache node, we can bring load balancing inside in a cluster. But what if we can consider a much larger scale, a scale with many clusters? Here, for example, we have M clusters. Each cluster has N servers. How to make this N, M times N servers balanced? A strongman solution is that we can just reuse the same result I just mentioned in the previous slide, that put a cache node in front of this M times N servers. And then you can solve the problem. But is that indeed the case? Please remember that your cache node needs to be as fast as aggregate of all servers. Let's look at some numbers. 
For example, if we have 32 clusters, and each cluster has 32 servers, and each server is equipping with uh, 40G throughput, then your aggregate bandwidth is around 41 terabits per second, it's, which is clearly not feasible and not scalable at all on a single node. So let's try to solve the problem step by step. So we can still deploy a single node in each of the cluster and make the servers inside one cluster balanced. However, the load between the clusters are still not balanced. But by putting these small nodes, each of the clusters right now has become a big server. Because inside this cluster, everything is balanced. It's good. And then you just need to add one big node that cache the hottest M log M items by reusing the same result I just mentioned. Then you can balance the load between the clusters, between the M clusters. However, please remember the name 41 terabits. We need to avoid using this big node anywhere. Instead, we introduce our work, this cache, which is kind of distributed cache mechanism to provide load balancing across clusters. So basically, the idea is that you do not need a big friend end cache. You can split that friend, friend end cache into a number of smaller cache nodes. As long as, the aggre as, as long as the aggregate bandwidth is equal to the big one. Here, for simplicity of the presentation, I split the big node into M cache nodes in an up layer. And the lower layer is some of the cache nodes for each of the cluster. So right now you have two layers, up layer and lower layer. So each node can have the same throughput or not the same throughput. As I will show later, our solution is a provable, practical, and a general mechanism, which means provable means we have the theoretical guarantee to fulfill any uh, query distribution. Practical and general means it has very simple primitive to implement and it can be applied to multiple different deployment scenarios. To design such a disk cache mechanism, ideally, disk cache needs to be as good as one big node to absorb the hottest items. So play exactly the same as the one big node. That's the ideal goal. So more specifically, you need to fulfill these three detail goals. First, first of all, you have a distribute cache mechanism, and if you have a smaller node, we still want to support arbitrary query workload to the hottest, I hottest items. And each node cannot be overloaded, for sure. And also, the workload of, to the storage clusters are dynamic. So we want, sometimes you need to update the caches periodically. So we want to keep the cache coherence cost at the minimal level. How can we do that? So keep these goals in mind. We have the following design challenges to design such a mechanism. First of all, once you identify these hottest items, how you allocate these hottest items to the cache? Do, you do not want to overload any cache node, and you do, want, do, do not want to incur any high co cache coherence cost. And second challenge, how to after you allocating these cached items, how to query the cached items. Right now, you have two layers, and each layer you have one copy, and then you have two choices. How to provide the best and stable query distribution. Challenge number three, how to update the cached items. So sometimes you need to update your cache. So for challenge three, we are using some two-phase Classical idea to two-phase update to ensure the cache coherence. For details, please read our paper. In today's talk, I'm talking about how we solve challenge number one and two. For challenge number one, how to allocate cache items. We can consider two standard Strowman solutions. First of all, let's just do replication. Once we identify the hottest item A, B, C, D, E, we replicate to all the nodes. It would for sure work, you know, combine the, the up layer cache node, it will for sure work the same as a big node. However, the replication incurs very high cache coherence cost. If you want to update item A, 
you need to update all the copies in the up layer, in all the nodes. Then let's try to do the partition. If we partition the, the hottest item based on some specific order, then there are some chances that your item, for example, A, B, C, has been cached to the same node in the up layer and also has been cached to another cache node in the lower layer. Then if A, B, C is really hot, it can overload the both nodes easily. So how we can overcome this issue? We propose this something that we're using independent hash function to allocate the cache items. So we need to make sure that you use pi-wise independent hash functions between the layers to allocate your items. Why? Let me give you an example. Considering CDF based on the hash function number one in the up layer has been cached to the third node in the up layer, there are some chances CDF is quite you know, hot and then overload this node. You need some help from the lower layer. And then we use another private independent hash function in the second layer to, to hash the items again. With some very high constant probability that because they are independent, then the CDF will be spread out in the lower layer, which gives you more helper to mitigate the loads to, you know, to, to help on the nodes on the up layer. In this case, we can provide a best cache allocation. And also, the in cache coherence cost is also small. You only need to update one copy per layer. OK, now we have got our cached items allocated. How to query these items? Naively, if we want to, for example, query item C, you can just query always from the up layer cache node first. And then if ca you consider the lower layer. But if the CDF, that node, is really crowded, and then you always fetch from the first uh, up layer node first, as I was showing the paper, that it does not always give you the best throughput. Sometimes it can be overloaded too. Instead, we're using some power two choices to query the cache cache item, which give you the best allocation between the two layers. Again, let's try to query item C. So assuming you know the loads of these two layer cache nodes, so you always fetch C from the node with lower current load. In this case, we guarantee the stable throughput. So let's put in two parts together. We have this cache. We have two primitives. First of all, we use independent hash function to allocate cache items. And you want to query items, use power two choices based on the current cache loads to route queries. Very simple techniques. But let's see what the theoretical guarantee behind this cache. At a very high level, the main theory is listed as the following. We prove that for M storage clusters, the this cache mechanism can absorb any query workload to the hottest items with the following condition. The following condition is query rate for single items is no larger than half of one cache node's throughput. So which means the condition that it's a relaxed condition because it means you, you, you do not know more than half of a cluster. So let's prove this main theory. The proof leverage the tools from expander graph, network flow, and querying theory. So to give you some sense about how the proof works, let's construct a bipartite graph. So on the left side is the A, B, C, D, E, F. It's the hottest items you want to serve in the two layer of caches. And the right side, 1, 2, 3 is the up layer cache nodes. 4, 5, 6 is the lower layer cache nodes. So if you want to find a location that two layer of cache nodes can serve your A, B, C, D, E, F, then it's become a perfect matching problem. And then we show in, in the paper that our power two choices query mechanism can always find a perfect matching for any query load distribution. Then QED. So for more details, please read our paper. 
Some remarks about the analysis part. So the number of cache nodes in two layers can be different, as long as the number of cluster M isn't too small. But please note that the, number of the, the load imbalance issue is only significant when the num M is large, right? So if the number of cluster is one to three, then load imbalance issue is not significant at all. And second, the throughput of the cache node can be also different, as long as the aggregate throughput is same. Then we can guarantee the aggregate throughput is almost same as big cache for arbitrary workload. So this is the theoretical guarantee we provide for this cache. Let's look at the example deployment scenario for this cache and implementation. For deployment, we can consider two examples. First of all, on the cache node, we can just use some DRAM or SSD array to serve as cache nodes. On the backend servers, we can use like flash memory or disk to serve as the backend storage servers. Another example is for the cache node, we can use the emergent programmable switches, which give you at the level of billion queries per second for each switch. And then your backend storage servers can be in memory, like uh, memcached or Redis and so on. In this cache, we demonstrate the benefits of our system by implementing this mechanism into a programmable switch-based caching. So we have two layers of programmable switches, and we have client-side cluster and client-side switch node, and also the backend servers are really storage servers. So when there's a cache hit, the server, so that when, when there's a cache hit, the switch that has that cache will directly reply. So latency is within some microsecond level. So when cache miss, query is handled, will be re redirected to the, the server directly, and the server will read its local copy and reply back to the clients. So this is a high level how the cache miss and how cache hit works. For implementation, we need to implement the cache switch and also the client-side switch. For the cache switch, we have two plans, control plan and data plan. The control plan, you need to maintain the cache management logic and network management logic. And for data plan, you need to maintain a cache, which is a key value pair, and a have heater detector, which is used for detecting what the recent hottest items being queried, and some routing module. And for, for client-side switch, you need to maintain the state of our query load statistics to help you to, to route queries based on our power two choices and also the querying routing module. So we, Im we implement using a language called P4, which stands for Programmable Protocol Independent Packet Processing. So the power of P4 is that besides the, the existing packet header, you can define your own packet header for caching. For example, here is a TCP packet. You're adding your own packet format, sequence number, operation, key, and value. So then you will go through a, a parser to pass the packet into shared memory and go through a series of match action table to that, that define your behavior, packet behavior. And at the end, it will be reconstruct you through the deep parser, and then you have a new packet. Let me give a quick example. Let's have a packet to get, get uh, item A. So here's the packet. It will go to the parser, and then it will be passed into some metadata and headers, Ethernet IP, TCP, sequence number one, operation get, key A. Currently, the value is none because you want to get that I item from the cache. And then you need to pass through your mesh action table. You can think of something like that. So if the match, the operation, is equal to get, then you, your action is trying to update your current load, plus plus. And then if the key is A, and A is also valid, then let's get the value of A. Third, once you get the value of A from the register stored in the S-ram of the switch, and then let's, let's update the header here. The header has been updated to the value of A. And at the deep parser, you reconstruct a new packet. 
that has updated the value of A. Then you reply back to the client. Then this is how the P4 programming looked like. So let's do some evaluation. The evaluation setup, we have two 6.4, 6.5 terabits Belfort Tofino programmable switch to emulate the upper layer and lower layer cache nodes and also the client side switches. And we have to have two 62 cores physical servers to emulate the storage servers and client servers. The baseline comparisons are no cache at all, partition, and replication. So the key takeaway of the evaluation is the following. For read queries, the disk cache works as good as replication. And for write queries, disk cache has performed significantly better if your write ratio is reasonable. What I mean reasonable is less than 30%, which is already pretty high. Even you have very large, l larger than 30% of write ratio, disk cache is no worse than partition. So th this is the summary. So let's look at the more detailed figures. So here, let's work with different workload distribution. The XSS is the different distribution, uniform, and some power law distribution like Ziffian with different parameters. P the larger parameters means the distribution is more skewed. And then you can see this cache offers nearly perfect throughput for skewed workload. It works as good as part, uh, replication. And also, if you want to scale to more number of nodes and with more number of clusters, this cache can also work as good as replication, same as the big node. Let's look at the right requires. If you're under very skewed workload, Zipfian 0.99 workload, this cache outperforms existing baseline comparisons. If your write ratio is reasonable, less than 30%, and then if your larger write ratio, it works as good as partition. So let me conclude. So this cache is a general distributed cache mechanism to ensure load balancing across many storage clusters. And it requires simple primitives with just independent Hessian and a power two choices for routing. And this cache provides near perfect throughput with rigorous theoretical guarantees. So I'm ending my talk now, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Like this is the client, this is the switch. Like which component actually keeps the information about the load of the node, right? And then decides to which to push. That's a good question. Yes. So in our implementation, we have a client side switch node. That switch nodes keep the state of art information about the current loads. So not client, but there is a switch that close to the client. But if you, you don't have that switch node, probably the client needs to maintain that information. Layers. Do you think it's possible to go to more layers? Is it does it make sense at all or not? I'm sorry. Does it make sense at all to go to more layers than two? Um, it's a good question. Yes. So clearly, that if you have one layer, the load between the cluster is not balanced, right? So adding one layer is the mi minimal requirement to make the cluster loads balanced. Mm -hmm. But if you have more layers. That would be a more relaxed condition. That you can more spread out your cache nodes. But a two layer is the minimal requirement. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you.